And I'm delighted to welcome our first uh, set of speakers, um, my gynaecology colleagues that I work with, um, and Dr. Varsha Jane, who's a clinical research fellow for wellbeing in women, and Professor Hilary Critchley, who's a professor of reproductive medicine and head of the Deanery of Clinical Sciences at Edinburgh University, um, and also consultant gynaecologist at the Royal Infirmary in Edinburgh. Um, in particular, Professor Critchley is a world lead in the area of menstrual disorders, and um, she serves on the FIGO Committee for Menstrual Disorders and Related Health Impacts. Um, and in particular, I'm very committed to addressing problems of menstrual, um, uh, menstrual issues and how we tackle the taboo around menstruation. So Varsha is going to be presenting the talk today. It's on uterine fibroids and venous thromboembolism. And thank you very much, both Varsha and Hilary, for joining us today. Thank you. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. Um, we'll be talking about, as Julius mentioned, venous um, thromboembolism and uterine fibroids. These are our disclosures, um, and I uh, just wanted to highlight those. And just to talk, just to give you a brief outline as to what we'll be talking about today. I know that the topic is venous thromboembolism, but I wanted to backtrack a little bit just to explain why two gynecologists are speaking and really give you an overview of abnormal uterine bleeding and the mechanisms of bleeding before we then talk about fibroids, the impact that fibroids have, and then their connection with VTE. And finally, a little word on a case uh, study that we have to present to you, but also um, a little note on progestins, which we'd welcome discussion on at the end as well. So abnormal uterine bleeding is essentially bleeding from the uterine corpus that's abnormal in frequency, duration, regularity and volume. And that essentially in a nutshell is when periods become more usually heavier, prolonged and more frequent, which is what women, uh, a number of women are affected by. And the prevalence at the moment, we think, is one in three women of reproductive age. However, studies are now coming out where we, it may be as high as one in two. Abnormal uterine bleeding has a significant and debilitating effect on all aspects of a woman's life and her family. And even though it may not be life threatening, um, it is definitely life altering. The FIGO committee um, <clears throat> uh, published a um, acronym to summarize the nine different categories of possible causes to lead to abnormal uterine bleeding. And they can be subdivided into structural causes, which include polyps, adenomyosis, leomyoma or fibroids, and malignancy or endometrial hyperplasia, and the non-structural causes, which are coagulation disorders, ovulatory dysfunction, endometrial disorders, iatrogenic problems, which is including anticoagulants, um, and not otherwise specified, which we're more often seeing now, as an example of which is cesarean scar defects. Now, I just wanted to highlight these two, which obviously the topic of our talk is fibroids today, but in order to understand the next part of the talk, I wanted to highlight the endometrial causes, which is where there's a fundamental problem in the functioning of the cells of the endometrium to lead to bleeding. So we're just going to recap quickly the menstrual cycle. It's carefully balanced um, processes within the endometrium. Um, it's sequential exposure to sex steroid hormones, estradiol and progesterone, which enable the endometrium to function normally. As estradiol levels rise, this leads to proliferation. And then after ovulation, progesterone levels rise and proliferation ceases and the endometrium decidualizes. And it's this balance of these hormones that lead to the normal functioning and therefore normal bleeding from the endometrium. But we know that a third of women with fibroids will suffer from abnormal uterine bleeding. And because treatments just aren't adequate, a third of these women then need to go on to have a hysterectomy. So talking about the mechanisms of why the endometrium bleeds abnormally, I'm going to talk about the evidence that we have from women with AUBE or endometrial cause. So it's understanding the normal processes of the endometrium that help us understand what happens when things go wrong. Now, in a nutshell, we don't know the exact reasons why there are changes in the cellular or molecular mechanisms of the endometrium. But in summary, we find that there is 
in women with AUBE, an exaggerated inflammatory response after progesterone withdrawal. And it's the timing and the localization of these inflammatory mediators, which is really important in then leading to a bleeding, an abnormal uterine bleeding picture. The vasculature within the endometrium also changes. So there's not as much vasoconstriction in the vasculature in women with AUBE. The vessels also don't mature as well, and this means that there's essentially a greater volume of blood that can be lost. This leads to also an inadequate hypoxic response, and that therefore leads to delayed repair of the endometrium, which is important in the cessation of bleeding. And something I don't need to explain at length here, but is also the importance of hemostasis in stopping that uh, blood loss. So we've got the um, subendothelial matrix, which is exposed to collagen and tissue factors, you then get the formation of a platelet plug. Then through the activation of the coagulation cascade, you get a fibrin clot being formed. But there needs to be a careful balance between um, clot formation and clot breakdown. And so the fibrinolysis pathway is also essentially very important here. And women with AUBE, you've got a significant increase in the fibrinolysis pathway, which causes them to have more heavier bleeding. So overall, if we look at the cellular molecular mechanisms, we see that there's an exaggerated inflammatory response, vasoconstriction and therefore hypoxia is reduced, which leads to delayed repair. And there is decreased hemostasis in essence due to increased fibrinolysis, but there are a lot of gaps in our current knowledge. Now let's take that to what we know about women with fibroids and how those women are bleeding. Now, ultimately, uterine fibroids will present in one of two ways, bleeding symptoms or bulk symptoms. So we'll talk about bleeding symptoms first. We know that there probably is um, a dysregulation in the processes to stop menstrual uh, bleeding or control menstrual bleeding that involves inflammation, vasoconstriction, hypoxia, the repair process, also hemostasis. But the problem is there's a dearth of literature around the evidence between the endometrium and women with fibroids and what's actually happening. A lot of the evidence is related to endometrial receptivity and fertility um, studies, but less related to AUB. Then there's also even further um, decrease in the amount of evidence that's available in the location of fibroids. So it's really important to highlight that fibroids can be placed in a number of different places within the uterus. And we know that the submucous type of fibroids, so that's zero, one, and two, do have a level of global change within the endometrium and the cellular molecular changes that are happening. However, there's very limited knowledge as if you've got an intramural fibroid, for example, number four on the picture, how does this change the endometrium and the endometrial functioning? We just don't know. Um, and it's also in these sorts of situations that FIGO suggests that if you've got an isolated intramural fibroid, you probably need to be looking at these um, non-structural causes like a coagulation disorder. And that's really um, important when you're thinking about the patient and the cause of their bleeding. And so we've got these cellular molecular processes and we've got a number of gaps. For example, that we just don't know what's happening with the hemostasis pathway in women in the endometrium from women with fibroids. So let's take that on now to look at bulk symptoms. So we understand that fibroids can grow. They grow slowly, generally over a number of years in women who present with them. And they're very common. So about 80, up to 80% of women by the age of 50 will suffer from, will have fibroids in some way or another. And we know that the mechanisms behind VTE really heavily rooted within Verkos triad, phenostasis, hypercoagulability, and endothelial damage being the important um, triad of markers. And when we think about fibroids, the physical presence of them could be compressing the iliac vessels. And we know with that compression can lead to venostasis, but also plus or minus endothelial damage, which again can lead to um, the sort of the starting point of, of a blood clot. But when we think about the treatments that we're giving for women with fibroids and AUB, you might have an element of hypercoagulability leading to that perfect storm of then creating um, or starting point for a venous thromboembolism. And because of the anatomy and the way that the vessels um, are located, left-sided ven venous thromboembolism is more frequent than the right side. And then we need to think about uterine size. So the majority of papers, now there are very limited papers on this topic, but the majority of papers will talk about a uterus being over one kilogram, leading to a much higher risk of venous thromboembolism. 
But I also found another paper that suggested maybe over two kilos. But as a gynecologist, I'm not really sure how I'm supposed to estimate the weight of a uterus because you have different molecular build, uh, makeup of these fibroids. And so I think what we need to take from that point is that the bigger the uterus, the higher the risk of venous thromboembolism. And then the length of time that the patient has fibroids is also important as well. We know that fibroids develop over a number of years, but we also know if there's one, there probably is going to be another. So you probably have more fibroids there. And that also then has an impact on the overall size, but the overall anatomy of where they're positioned as well. Which takes us on to the fourth point, the positioning of the fibroids is really important. Whereas from a bleeding perspective, the submucous fibroids are probably important. From a venous thromboembolism, we're thinking about the subserosal fibroids, those positioned on the outside of the uterus would be heavily important here as well. So it's understanding that position makes a huge difference. Now, when we think about the management considerations, ultimately, if there's pressure and compression, which is the most likely cause of venous thromboembolism with fibroids, we want to be able to remove that pressure um, and ultimately that's by, via surgery so considering the woman her age her fertility goals and the risk of likelihood of these fibroids growing again or any remaining fibroids the woman may decide that she wants to choose myomectomy which is removal of fibroids or a hysterectomy which is a removal of the uterus but overall that elective surgery can't be done immediately as soon as you have the venous thromboembolism. And as you know, we need to anticoagulate the patient, stabilize the blood clot as well, reduce the risk of further bleeding disorders from that anticoagulation. And so elective surgery is usually postponed four weeks after commencing anticoagulation, but ideally we're waiting for three months. So we can understand there that we've got an element that we're giving anticoagulation to a patient with quite large fibroids potentially, and they therefore may be at a bleeding risk as well. So when we think about the medical options that we're giving these women, um, full anticoagulation can therefore also lead to heavy menstrual bleeding. So if we remember our non-structural causes, that falls within the iatrogenic causes. So that's something that we need to combat. And usually in patients with heavy menstrual bleeding, we would be giving them sort of some sort of estrogen containing medication. However, this is contraindicated, of course, in women with venous thromboembolism. Now, then we think about um, a levonorgestrel releasing intrauterine system, for example, the Mirena coil, which is possibly effective. And it's the number one treatment we would use for women with heavy menstrual bleeding, according to the NICE guidance. However, we, we've also got to remember that in a large fibroid uterus, the cavity is also quite large. And therefore, placement of this sort of coil could be problematic. The next thing we need to think about is oral progestins. And I've got a slide later on. But overall, the, the evidence is that they do increase venous thromboembolism risk. And I'll talk about this in more detail later. And I've highlighted here GnRH analogs. And this examples of this are decapeptal or Zolodex. Now, they reduce the bleeding because they act on um, the HPG axis. Um, they reduce venous thromboembolism. They, they have no increased risk of venous thromboembolism. And they do reduce venous, uh, fibroid size. But you do have to think about the patient as a whole here, where you do end up in patients, especially younger patients, where they have menopausal side effects as well. So may not be tolerated. Um, find a, a little note about GnRH receptor antagonists. Um, these are coming on the market. At the moment, we have something called Reecho. However, that is an agent that was also combined with an estrogen containing HRT. So that wouldn't be suitable, but we've got to watch this space because there might be sort of a tablet version of a GnRH receptor antagonist without the HRT in it. So that might be an option in the future. Um, and then most importantly, we've got to remember that these women are probably bleeding. They've probably got iron deficiency or and or iron deficiency anemia. So remembering that this is extremely common in women with heavy menstrual bleeding. 60% of patients with um, heavy menstrual bleeding will have iron deficiency. 30% will have iron deficiency anemia. And then you've ex this is all exacerbated. So we definitely need to treat that alongside this as well. We have patients who have heavy menstrual bleeding due to fibroids. They're on anticoagulation and therefore they've got possible element of AUBI, so an iatrogenic cause. And overall, we've got to remember women with fibroids may have other non-structural causes of AUB. So 13% of women with heavy menstrual bleeding will have um, a coagulation disorder. So again, we've got to manage that. But there's also this factor that because they're on anticoagulation, is that possibly mitigating the risk of further clots? We just don't know. And we've got to balance that with the clotting risk. So this topic of oral progestins, um, it leads to a lot of discussion because 
Norethisterone, we know, is probably one of the most potent um, oral progestins. However, it's metabolized to ethanol estradiol metabolite, and that increases um, venous thromboembolism risk. And in this paper that I've quoted here, an odds ratio of three. Um, so when we talk about oral medoxyprogesterone acetate, so Provera, um, in doses over 20 milligrams a day, so quite often we're using 10 milligrams twice a day in women with heavy menstrual bleeding, this is associated with an increased risk of venous thromboembolism as well. And finally, Depo-Provera, which sometimes is used as a contraceptive agent, but also very effective control of bleeding, is also associated with a higher risk of VTE. So I know that doesn't technically fall in the oral uh, category, but I wanted to put that there as well. And so when we think about risk of VTE, we've got a hierarchy in terms of what's more likely to give you a risk of VTE. So I had given, I was given the question of what would you do immediately if you've got a patient with uterine fibroids who's got a venous thromboembolism, but she comes to us with acute AUB. And I think if I think about the evidence, I think about the literature, I think about what we know with these patients, the GnRH analogs obviously give us the best um. VTE sort of um, profile or less, no increased risk. However, we've got to remember that they take two to three weeks to work. And you've got a patient with acute AUB who needs that bleeding stemmed because you don't want them to be bleeding out or needing blood transfusions. So I think actually having a really careful conversation with the patient, taking an individualized approach and a short course of oral MPA, discussing the risks and benefits, probably to stem the bleeding for maybe 10 to 14 days, um, might actually work to sort of um, reduce the bleeding or stop the bleeding and give the GnRH analog time to work. So overall, I just wanted to talk about the take home messages. So what can we take from this? Essentially, the management of acute bleed has to be multidisciplinary. I think there's got to be conversations between the gynecologist and the hematologist. We want to be using an agent that can stop the bleeding, but also not massively increase the VTE, but then give a long term solution until we can stabilize the blood clot, get the anticoagulation to work and think about what surgical options we would want to do if appropriate. We definitely need to be thinking about iron deficiency, iron deficiency anemia, and we need to be monitoring and reassessing the risk in a multidisciplinary way. So seeing the patient either together or having clinics side by side and keeping that open line of communication. Finally, we've got to treat the patient as a whole. So we've got to think about fertility desires, <coughs> timing of surgery, if that's appropriate, but also remember polypharmacy. So how many of her medications are needed and what other medications are leading to an increased risk of VTE or changing the hypercoagulability of her blood? And finally, the only no bleed, no bulk symptom option with women with fibroids is a hysterectomy. But as major surgery, that's not without risk either. Either So it's not sort of a very simple, straightforward message. So just overall, just wanted to say that this is quite a complex area. It needs a lot of people involved, an individualized approach to the patient. But I think also constant reassessing of the risks of each individual patient before a final um, sort of solution has come to. So thank you very much. And I welcome further discussion and anyone's comments that they may have about oral progestins as well um, or any of the management options I've discussed. So thank you very much indeed, uh, Barsha. I mean, wow, that's taken us through um, just an incredible educational talk on fibroids and then how, how they're managed and treated, but just the just the different ways these present and present to hematologists like myself, both with the bleeding and then trying to stem the bleeding. The ladies get blood clots. And I was thinking, just as you were talking, in your slide on management considerations, you're talking about the heavy bleeding. And I'm thinking, these ladies are often empirically started on norethisterone and tranexamic acid. And then they've also got the bulk pressure, perhaps, although you can't tell that usually on ultrasound. And so perhaps this is a multifactorial condition causing the thrombosis. Um, do, you, do you want to comment on that at all? Do you think there's one factor is more predominant or do you think it, it could be it could be lots of different things creating the presenting picture? I think um, from my knowledge of venous thromboembolism, I think we've got to say that it's multifactorial. Um, I think quite often as gynecologists, we're very good at asking about 
pressure on the bladder and pressure on the bowel. But we, I think we very much forget about VT as a risk with fibroids um, and we don't screen for that. So we focus on bleeding, we focus on an element of bulk symptoms. But I do think actually we probably need to be more aware as well of the size of the uterus and how we usually counsel patients that we would start with conservative management um, which clearly might not be an option for our patients but medical treatments non-hormonal which is a tranexamic acid and then the hormonal which is quite often the estrogen campaign containing contraceptive pills these are just not suitable but I think as gynecologists we don't recognize or often associate that VTE as a problem um, until the patient has a VTE. Um, so I do think it is multifactorial in the way that the clot is forming, the clot is developing. And I think both in a, a, in a joint multidisciplinary way, I think being more active and more vocal about this risk of VTE is really, really important in, in preventing them in the future as well. Julia, if I could just add um, two comments and say a big thank you to, again, Dr. Jane, who put a lot of work into researching and thinking about what would be educationally important here. Um, so a thank you, Varsha. But two things just in general. Um, we have a huge waiting list across the United Kingdom now uh, for uh, gynecology for chronic debilitating conditions. I am going to not use the word benign because I think benign uh, trivializes what actually is a chronic debilitating complaint and that we need to raise awareness that if a patient has chronic bleeding, heavy at risk of anemia, has a large fibroid uterus, putting her at risk of venous thromboembolism, then these are patients who need prioritization of care. And when we think about our long outpatient waiting lists, and if in the event surgery, which may not be a preferred option, but sometimes has to be considered, these patients should not, well, I'll switch it. These patients actually move into an urgent um, category because theoretically what was a life altering condition could become a life threatening condition because of course venous thromboembolism isn't without risk. So that was one comment. And the other one was when Varsha said, watch this space for the GNRH receptor antagonists. I think in the future, we will have an oral daily pill to replace the monthly injection of decapeptil. And this daily tablet will be much easier for the patient. Care will have to be initiated in secondary care. It's not yet licensed in the UK, but I'm sure it's coming or coming very soon. And it will work so much quicker than the injection. It will work within days rather than within weeks. So again, um, we will have to learn how to use it in our armamentarium of options. But I think, you know, in a year's time, we may possibly have something else to add to the uh, therapy mm. list. Very interesting. Thank you for those comments, and particularly the one about um, the urgency of seeing seeing these ladies, because we have had experience post pandemic of ladies developing quite extensive DVTs with with fibroids who've been on waiting lists. And I'm sure it might be the same in other parts of the country. Now we've got just a few more minutes before we introduce our obstetric team, but Dr. Baggett has a question. Oh, sorry, I thought it might be quite nice if you could actually see my face. Yeah. Um, so um, thank you so much for an absolutely fascinating talk. Really, really interesting. In a, in a previous life, I was a gynecologist for a year, so I found it absolutely, absolutely fascinating. Um, my question is, is about use of hormones and venous thrombosis. Um, the Dutch in particular, for a very, very long time, um, have been continuing the oral contraceptive pill after someone has a venous thrombosis after they start anticoagulation and certainly I've seen the other side of that in hematology obstetric clinics where someone gets a venous thrombosis they stop the pill and four months later they're pregnant um I certainly myself seeing the Dutch experience thinking of the sort of um pathophysiology and, and pharmacodynamics and kinetics of of the pill I think there probably is safe to use estrogen and progesterone when someone's on, on anticoagulation after having had venous thrombosis, I'd be really interested to know what the two of you think about that. I think it's so with 
Yeah, um, I think it's very interesting. I think I know the studies that you're referring to in the papers. Um, we've also got to remember that quite often we're seeing patients who've got heavy menstrual bleeding as a result of their fibroids as well. And if we remember back to the mechanisms of heavy menstrual bleeding, the balance between estrogen and progesterone, the role that the estrogen and the progesterone have. So I think if you're using a low dose estrogen um, containing contraceptive pill with a very low dose of estrogen and a suitable progestin, potentially then the anticoagulation could negate the side effects of a possible exacerbation of a VTE for contraceptive benefit. However, when you're using the combined contraceptive pill for control of bleeding, you need 30 to 35 micrograms of estradiol in order to stabilize the endometrium so that they don't get the breakthrough bleeding as a result of having that there um, and to have any impact or reduction on the heavy menstrual bleeding. And so I think it's a balance. And also we've got to think about the age of these patients as well. In patients who maybe have a large fibroid uterus in their 20s, we wouldn't be wanting to start, you know, long term GnRH analogs. And so we may have to balance that risk. Um, but I think when it comes to the COCP, especially it's contraindicated in women over the age of 35, you know, um, quite often a lot of our patients might have a high BMI. We've got to think about the patient as a whole and other risk factors there as well in terms of balancing their risk of VTE, but also um um, other reasons as well um, why they might not be using the combined pill. I mean, the only comment I would add there is that it just shows you the complexity of care and that we have to move away from this one size fits all approach. We have to work, as I'm sure many of us do across the country, uh, in close collaboration with our hematologists, you know, as gynecologists, as obstetricians, with our hematology colleagues. And I think that, you know, thinking also about delivery routes as to whether if there is a risk, we can minimize it. So um, if we're thinking about contraceptives, they're now becoming available in um, you know, transdermal delivery uh, routes. Um, I'm not sure transdermal estrogen has a different venous thromboembolism risk than ethanol estradiol orally or micronized estradiol orally. Um, I'm sure there are experts on the call who know more about this, but we have to also remember, and I know I can see uh, my colleague Anne Armstrong uh, on this moment of the call, pregnancy has a greater risk of um, venous thromboembolism probably than taking the combined oral contraceptive pill. So it is all about, you know, getting the balance and so I think you raise an important point but people are nervous to give estrogens to patients who have VTE and are anticoagulated so you know there does need to be sort of endorsement from hematology that it's okay if we're considering that and um, I don't know whether you'd agree with my comment about the risk of pregnancy being a greater VTE risk than the oral contraceptive. Yeah I, I completely agree. I completely agree, Hilary. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And so this is uh, just showing that there's so much more that we need to know and so many research questions in this area. But I want to move on now, but to thank you very much, Varsha and Hilary, for joining us this morning and stimulating the discussions. I'm sure there'll be lots of chat later on, but thank you for your hard work. And Professor Critchley, thank you very much for also joining and sharing your expertise. Well, thank, thank you, you all. And you'll forgive us if we now go to our other meeting, but we wish you an excellent uh, rest of the day of, I'm sure, terrific um, contributions and discussion. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye now. Um, so we're going to move on next to my good colleague, uh, Dr. Anna.